Now the first thing to look at is the landlocked country of Afghanistan shares its borders with Pakistan, China, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Iran and Uzbekistan and it has a huge population of 38.2 million people making it the 37th most populated country in the world. Now the people who make up Afghanistan they're called Afghans not Afghanis which is the currency that they use and it's a common mistake that people make. The next thing is that the country of Afghanistan is the world's 42nd largest by land area with Kabul serving as its capital and largest city. The total land area is 652,860 square kilometers. And human habitation in Afghanistan dates back to the Middle Paleolithic era and the country's strategic location along the Silk Road connected it to cultures of the Middle East as well as other parts of Asia. Afghanistan's national game is Bhutan. Kashi, which literally translates to goat pulling and they want this to be an Olympic sport. Good luck with that because it's regarded as the wildest sport game out there. It involves placing the carcass of a goat, a calf or a sheep placed in the center of a circle which is surrounded by players of two teams who are on horseback. The objective of the game is to pick up the carcass and bring it across a goal line or into the winner's circle. The game has been played since the 13th century and used to be played earlier by rich rival warlords but it's now being finally financed by Afghan phone companies as well as private airlines. Also carpet weaving has always been an integral part of the Afghan heritage for centuries with ethnic diversity drawn from other cultures like Iran, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. The Afghan rugs are an extremely popular Afghanistan export. In 2008, 2013 and 2014 Afghan rugs won international awards which is held every year in Hamburg, Germany. Most Afghan weavers today make rugs that are about the same as those that have been woven for decades. And as a testament to the meticulous nature of this art, it approximately takes six to nine months to weave one large Afghan carpet. Many reports also state that only 28.1% of the population above the age of 15 is literate in Afghanistan which means 71.9% of adults in the country do not have simple reading and writing abilities. And hopefully that continues to change over the years because the more educated you are of course the more power to you. It's also the land of opium. Opium is the largest and fastest growing produce in Afghanistan. Afghanistan's opium poppy production goes into more than 90% of heroin worldwide. Afghanistan has been the world's greatest illicit opium producer and in 2017 opium cultivation in Afghanistan reached a record high. The fact that the opium poppy cultivation continues to expand in Afghanistan is not surprising. I mean the country's economy has been in a deep slump since 2013 when the United States and NATO radically drew down their troop presence around which much of Afghanistan's economy was built after 2002. Now the bottom line is that there is simply nothing in Afghanistan that produces more jobs than the opium poppy economy and there's nothing else that would surpass it in the foreseeable future. Another interesting fact is that the world's first oil paintings were not drawn in the Renaissance Europe contrary to popular belief but in the caves of Bamiyan. Located in the central heartlands of Afghanistan around 650 BC. In 2008 scientists discovered oil paintings in 12 out of 50 caves in Bamiyan possibly made with walnut or poppy. Bamiyan was once a thriving Buddhist center where monks lived in a series of caves carved into the cliffs by two statues. This was a spot where the world's two largest standing Buddha statues once stood until the Taliban destroyed them in 2001 saying that the statues were un-Islamic. Poetry is also a very important part in Afghan culture. For thousands of years, Afghans have told their tales in the form of verses. In the western side of Herat, Thursday is a poetry night. Every Thursday, people from all across the city get together to share verses from old and new poetry and they get together with desserts and sweet tea and bond over poetry. That sounds pretty 
awesome. Kind of like my kind of thing. I love just chill vibes, poetry, spoken word, you know what I mean? I might enjoy it over in Afghanistan. The next thing I want to talk about is the Kandar Airfield, situated in southern Afghanistan, is known to be the world's single busiest runway airstrip. It is also the location where NATO has its first full air traffic facility in a country not listed in NATO. And the final fact about Afghanistan is that Afghanistan became independent on August 19th of 1919 and they fought three wars with Britain after which they declared themselves independent. Woohoo! Now interestingly they were never directly ruled by the British. However, like every other country in South Asia, their foreign affairs were heavily influenced by the United Kingdom. Nicknamed the graveyard of empires, Afghanistan has had a reputation for being unconquerable and for undoing ambitious military ventures and humiliating would-be conquerors. The Soviets also tried to invade Afghanistan but they were forced out. Afghans did not give in so easily. Starting off with number 10, Ahmad Shah Durrani is known as the father of the nation and he is the founder of the last Afghan empire. He was crowned back in the year 1747 and he was the one who merged the country into one kingdom since their principalities and provinces were just completely fragmented. Did you know that New Year's is celebrated in Afghanistan on March 21st? Yeah, not January 1st like many other parts of the world. They call their New Year Naraz and it's a festival that's celebrated by gathering travelers from all across Afghanistan to the city of Mezar-e-Sharif and this city has a mosque in the center of it and this mosque is called the Blue Mosque or the Shrine of Hazrat Ali who was the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. Now greeting people with a handshake is the most common greeting in Afghan culture and some people also place their hand on their heart and nod slightly to show respect or approval to the person or persons that they are greeting. However, shaking hands between male and female is not common and is completely avoided especially in public. So I was curious to know, you know, what languages are found in Afghanistan? Well, in Afghanistan there is Afghan Persian or Dari, which is the official language and is spoken by 77% of the population. There's also Pashto and what I found is that this is also an official language, so it's the second official language spoken in Afghanistan by 48% of the population. There's also Turkic languages like Uzbek and Turkmen and smaller languages like Balochi, and English and Urdu, but those are spoken by a very tiny percentage of the population. Afghanistan is also very rich in natural resources. Afghanistan's natural resources comprise of silver, zinc, gold, copper, and iron ore that are found in the southeast. There's precious and semi-precious stones in the northeast. You'll also find petroleum and natural gas reserves in the northern part of the country. And Afghanistan also has uranium, coal, chromides, talc, barites, sulfur, lead, as well as salt. This minaret right here is called the Minaret of Jam and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Western Afghanistan. It's the second tallest minaret in the entire world and it stands at 203 feet tall. The minaret was built around the year 1190 entirely of baked brick and it has verses from the Quran on it. Now this and other minarets are thought to have been built as symbols of the victory of the growth of Islam in the land. Now speaking of heritage sites, around 400 BC the Greeks built a city at Iconum which is situated in northern Afghanistan which had a gym and a theater. It also contained the Greek deity Hercules and also a large figure dedicated to the god Zeus. This is also a heritage site. Afghanistan is home also to the famous Hindu Kush which is an 800 kilometer long mountain range that connects central Afghanistan and northern Pakistan. It raises over 18,000 feet and it's also known in ancient Greek as the Caucasus Indicus and also known as the Paropamisedi. So the snow leopard here is the national animal of Afghanistan. Now the snow leopard lives in the northeast and the population of the snow leopard it's it pretty much a guess like it's you can only roughly estimate but according to some estimates there's between 100 and 200 of these in Afghanistan. The animal is said to symbolize bravery, fearlessness and beauty. A fitting animal to depict the country and the people of Afghanistan. 
And now the final thing I want to share is that most Afghans were actually Hindu and Buddhist or Zoroastrians way back in the day. But during the Arab invasion in 642 CE, this introduced Islam. Now the Arabs defeated the Sasanians and ruled until the year 870, at which time they were driven out again by the Persians. All right, let's get started by talking about the capital city. Kabul is the capital and largest city of Afghanistan. Located in the eastern section of the country, it is also a municipality forming part of the greater Kabul province, and it's divided into 22 districts. According to estimates in 2021, the population of Kabul is around 4.6 million and it serves as Afghanistan's political, cultural and economical center. Surprisingly, rapid urbanization has made Kabul the world's 75th largest city. Kabul is located high up in a narrow valley between the Hindu Kush mountains and bounded by the Kabul River, with an elevation of 1,790 meters, making it one of the highest capitals in the world. Now, this city is said to be over 3,500 years old, mentioned since at least the time of the Achaemenid Empire. Today, Kabul is known for its historical gardens, bazaars, and palaces. Some well-known examples being the Gardens of Babur and Darul Aman Palace. All right, let's talk a little bit about the country's main sources of income. The main source of income in the country is agriculture, and during its good years, Afghanistan produces enough food and products to provide for the people, as well as to create a surplus for export. The major food crops produced include corn, rice, barley, wheat, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. In Afghanistan, the industry is also based on agriculture and pastoral raw materials. The major industrial crops are cotton, tobacco, madder, castor beans, and sugar beets. Sheep farming is also extremely valuable. The major sheep product exports are wool and the highly prized Karakul sheepskins. Afghanistan is also a land that is rich in natural resources. There are numerous mineral and precious stone deposits, as well as natural gas and yet untapped petroleum stores. Some of these resources have been exploited, while others have remained relatively untouched. All right, have you ever heard of the country of the pomegranate? Afghanistan may be considered the country of the pomegranate fruit because of the excellent quality of the cultivars that thrive there. Afghanistan is a land for 48 leading world cultivars of pomegranate, commonly growing in Kandahar, Kapisa, Zamangan, Farha, Nanroz, and Balkh provinces. The Kandahar province has historically widely been known as the main production area for its high quality and productivity. Interestingly, some leading botanists believe that Afghanistan is the cradle of world pomegranate production and that it has more varieties of pomegranate trees than anywhere else in the world. In 2009, several hundred thousand pomegranate trees were planted and the nation exported some 50,000 tons of this delicious fruit. In 2010, Afghanistan began exporting the fruit to the French grocery store firm Carrefour in Dubai. This has created significant competition there among their Turkish and North African counterpart brands, as the Afghan product is said to be larger, redder, and juicier. So if you haven't done so already, try and get your hands on an Afghan pomegranate. All right, moving on to fact number seven, talking about New Year celebrations. Unlike many countries around the world who celebrate the new year on January 1st, New Year in Afghanistan is celebrated on the 21st of March, and they call it Nauroz. It is a pre-Islamic festival, for those of you who may not know. It is celebrated by the gathering of thousands of travelers from across Afghanistan to the city of Mazari Sharif. During the first 40 days of the year, this is when it happens, when red tulips grow in the green plains and over the hills surrounding the city. Now, this location is home to a famous mosque in the center of the city. It is known as the Blue Mosque or the Shrine of Hazrat Ali, who was the cousin and son-in-law of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. During the first two weeks of the new year, the citizens of Kabul hold 
family picnics in Istalif, Charakar, and other green places where redbud shrubs grow. You may also be surprised to hear that at one point between 1996 to 2001, Nauruz was banned and labeled as an ancient pagan holiday centered on fire worship. All right, Afghanistan is home to the world's largest Buddha? Well, let's talk about that. Unfortunately, these amazing historical statues have been, for the most part, destroyed as of 2001. Prior to their recent destruction, the sixth to 7th century rock carved Buddha sculptures in the Bamiyan Valley of central Afghanistan were considered the largest in the world. Known collectively as the Bamiyan Buddhas, the two monumental sculptures have amazed both Buddhist and non-Buddhist visitors for more than a thousand years. Both images were carved into the cliffside in high relief. The area near the heads of both Buddha figures and the area around the larger Buddha's feet were carved in the round, allowing worshippers to circumambulate. Circumambulation, which is the act of walking around an object such as a stupa or a reliquary mound, or an image of the Buddha. It is a common practice in Buddhist worship. Like many of the world's great ancient monuments, little is known about who commissioned the Bamiyan Buddhas or the sculptors who carved them. However, their very existence points to the importance of the Buddhist faith and the Bamiyan Valley during this period. Coming in at fact number five, we have accessibility to communications and technology. So communications in Afghanistan is under the control of the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology. It has rapidly expanded since late 2001 and is increased on the accessibility to wireless companies, the internet, radio stations, and television channels. The Afghan government signed a $64.5 million agreement in 2006 with China China's ZTE on the establishment of a countrywide optical fiber cable network. The project began to improve telephone, internet, television, and radio broadcast services throughout Afghanistan. About 90% of the country's population had access to communication services as of 2014. According to the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, there are 4,760 active towers throughout the country, which covers 85% of the population. The ministry plans to expand its services in remote parts of the country, where the remaining 15% of the population will be covered with the installation of 700 new towers. So so yes, believe it or not, having a mobile phone is actually considered to be a status symbol for many. Next up, we're going to talk about democracy in Afghanistan. Well, yes, you may not have been aware, but since 1978, Afghanistan has been in a state of continuous internal conflict and foreign interventions. So it makes sense that having a stable and reliable form of government would have posed as a challenge. But surprisingly, in December of 2004, Mr. Hamid Karzai became the first ever democratically elected head of the state of Afghanistan. All right, coming in at number three, we're talking about the poster boy of Afghan men. Perhaps the most surprising fact for me today is that Arnold Schwarzenegger is considered to be the poster boy for legions of young Afghan men. Photographs of a muscled Arnold in his prime hang from the walls of hundreds of bodybuilding centers across the country. Some Afghans say the action star turned U.S. governor even looks like an Afghan. All right, and let's talk about how the family is essential to Afghan culture. In Afghanistan, men are typically laden with the responsibility of earning for the family, while women are expected to stay home and serve the family. However, in modern Afghanistan, you may also find some women working in the cities and earning a living for themselves and their families. In most cases, the family lives together in the same house. Even upon marriage, the son and his wife live separately in a different room, but still in the family home. 
So we can see here that the bond of family is so strong that even after marriage, newlyweds are happy to live amongst the rest of the family. Although many other global countries have this same cultural practice, this is quite different than the Western tradition of moving out of the family home and starting a new life in a new home as a married couple. And coming in at number one, we're gonna be talking about the religion of Islam. Now, you might be surprised to find out that the history of Islam in Afghanistan is quite detailed and thoroughly documented. Literally, it would probably take me a lot of time to read through all of the details. However, for the simple purposes of this video today, I'm not gonna go into the specific details of how Islam was introduced to Afghanistan. However, what I did find interesting was the belief that Arab Muslims spread the religion of Islam in Afghanistan around 642 CE in Herat and Zarang. At the time, they recognized Afghanistan as Al-Hind due to the country's proximity to India. <laughs> 